السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all his companions, his entire household. May Allah bless them and bless every single one of us. My brothers and sisters, a beautiful evening here in Malaysia. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us, including those who are listening from overseas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to learn lesson from the lives of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who were indeed the best of hearts after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This evening we will be looking at the life of the great Ali ibn Abi Talibin radiyallahu anhu. He was the fourth khalif in Islam and he took over from Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu. He was born in Makkah al-Mukarrama and he was approximately 30 years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Something interesting is the man who looked after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the death of his grandfather was the father of Ali, who was known as Abu Talib. This Abu Talib was the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who defended Islam and the Muslims, but he did not accept Islam himself. And he had a son known as Ali ibn Abi Talib. That was Ali, the cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They had a very, very good relation from a very young age. And the reason is Abu Talib went through some difficult time in his life. And there was a time when he could not afford to look after his children. So he decided to take two of the three children he had to his relatives. So he took one to Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, who was his brother. And he told him, would you look after one of my children? So Al-Abbas says, I will look after Ja'far, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And he, he then approached Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, would you look after one of my children? And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I will look after Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali radiallahu anhu, his age was approximately five to six years old when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to take care of him. So he grew up with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. This was amazing. They were so close. He used to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherever he went. Most places that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go, they found Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu walking with him as a young boy. So much so that even the cave of Hira that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to meditate in, sometimes Ali ibn Abi Talib would join him radiallahu an. So when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was granted prophethood by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ali ibn Abi Talib who loved him so much was the first from amongst the boys to accept Islam. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was the first from amongst the men. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was the first from amongst the boys to accept Islam. And how exactly it happened, there are two versions. But both of them are quite similar uh, in their narration. The one says that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha reading salah meaning worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what are you doing? So he said, I am worshipping Allah who made me. And I do not worship the idols. The idols are wrong. It is wrong to do what Quraysh is doing. And he explained to him what Islam was and he invited him to Islam. And Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu accepted the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One narration says, he said, let me talk to my father. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, you've got to think if you would like, you accept it, but I'd like you to keep it to yourself for now because I've not been instructed yet to go and tell the others. And no sooner was that said, a little while later, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. So these are some of the narrations of how he became a Muslim, but he was a young boy, perhaps approximately 10 years old. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us those who are obedient and our children as well, such that when we speak to our children, they listen to us. Amin. 
Then one of the famous stories in the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was the story at the time of the hijrah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was migrating to al Madinah al munawwara That night, the kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelievers had plotted to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They actually sent people to encircle the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to let Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu lay in his bedding. Amazing. This was something that would have put the life of someone at risk because these people were planning to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They could have stormed the house and attacked the person in the bedding, believing that it was the bedding of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But here Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu immediately agreed and he was the one on the bedding of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that night. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left the home, they did not even know that he is no longer in the house. They saw the bedding and they said he is still there, not realizing that it was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. The following day when they started to find out who was in the bedding, they realized it was actually Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. So this was one of the great sacrifices that were made by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu at the time of the hijrah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one might ask, well, when did Ali radiallahu anhu go for the hijrah himself? He went approximately three days later. Three days later, when the message came to him from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam via a certain companion, and it arrived there at Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he then chose to go. And some narrations say he was alone. Some say that he was with a group of women. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us to worship him in a way that nobody hinders us when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they left Makkah al mukarramah due to hindrance. They were hindered when it came to worshiping Allah. So they had to go to al Madina al munawwara So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so close to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. When the kuffar of Quraysh saw Ali in, Madi in Mecca, they knew immediately that Muhammad sallallahu must be nearby. And these were from the noblemen of Quraysh. They were from families that had deep roots in Quraysh, yet they were still being persecuted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from persecution. My brothers and sisters, there came a time the second year after the hijrah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherein Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was married to the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam known as Fatima binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what exactly happened? Well, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, O oh Ali, what do you have? You want to marry my daughter, but what do you have to give her in terms of a mahar? Now you and I would know that mahar is not a dowry in every sense of the meaning of the term dowry. It is a gift that is given from the groom to the bride. And that is something that Islam has stipulated in order for us to acknowledge the status of a woman and the fact that the male is primarily responsible for the upkeep or for looking after the women and for spending on them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Primarily the man is supposed to be the breadwinner. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that this man does not own a home. He's not a wealthy man. He doesn't have much, but he gave him his daughter. This is a lesson for us all. Today, when you want to get married, first thing you do is you ask the man, what do you have? What type of a job do you have? What car do you drive? Do you have a house? How much is your salary? What figure do you have? If not, we fight with the daughter and say, not this man. He's not good enough. Not realizing that our own fathers, and I'm sure those whom I'm speaking to today, our fathers or grandfathers, when they got married, they were much happier than we are. And they married those who had absolutely no house, no shoes sometime. They were just honest, upright, pious people. And they were people who the, the fathers of the girls knew that this person is so honest and so responsible that he will look after my daughter, even if he doesn't have something right now, but he's a responsible man. So they let them get married. They were happier than those in our generation who look for money prior to you getting married. So how is it? You will only be married at the age of 40, my beloved brother, because that is when you will own a house. May Allah make it easy for us to look at the lesson of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He married 
the daughter of the greatest of all Fatima binti Muhammad radiallahu anha and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved his daughter so much do you think he would have given his daughter to someone who really had absolutely nothing according to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ali ibn Abi Talib had a lot he had iman he was an upright youngster he grew up with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so his character and his religion were of a very very high level if not one of the highest this is what is to be looked at to this day idha atakum man tardawna deenahu wa khuluqahu fazawwijuh if someone comes to marry your daughter they have good character and conduct and a high level of deen let them get married subhanallah let them get married from this we learn that those who choose to look at wealth and wealth alone and status in society and status alone a lot of the times they doom their daughters into great depression yet they just want to save their names that's why they got them married there may allah protect us it's not always the case but it is happening more often today than ever before may allah grant us the ability to seek guidelines from the messenger we claim to love so much here is he this is what he did with ali ibn abi talib he says oh ali what do you have he says i have nothing he says oh ali you have an armor the armor that you have what about that he said yes i do have the armor he said, well, you can sell the armor and give the amount to my daughter. So he did not say pay me for my daughter and you need to pay my, the rest of my family and bring gifts. And we need to have a night before you get married. That will be even bigger than the marriage itself. And we need to start celebrating in this way and that way. It was something so simple. He said, oh, Ali, that is the dira. That is the armor. I have now married you to my daughter. And that will be the mahar. That will be the amount that you will give as a gift to my own daughter. They were married and they, the ceremony was not even what we would see today. It was something that was an agreement between them. They had the witnesses that were there. Simple occasion. And this was one of the most blessed of all marriages ever. May Allah grant us ease. So listen to what Ali ibn Abi Talib did. He went out to the market to sell his armor. So Uthman ibn Affan who was married to the other daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are now brothers-in-law, right? So he says, oh Ali, what are you doing? He says, I'm here to sell my dirah, to sell my armor, because I am about to marry the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fatima. Uthman was so happy. He said, can I pay you for it? What do you want? He says, I want 400 dirhams. He says, okay, no problem. Here is the 400. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. He paid him a certain amount, some say 400, some say 480, little gold coins. So that would be dananir, dinars. So what happened is, he paid him the amount, and when he took the armor, and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu took the amount, Uthman ibn Affan calls him back and says, Oh Ali, this is a gift from me to you. Here is an armor, you can have this, subhanallah. So he went back with the armor, and with the 400 as well, subhanallah. And he went to give it and he told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about what Uthman ibn Affan had done. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so delighted and so happy. Imagine these were now family members related to one another. They had big hearts. May Allah grant us ease. Today, a father will not help his own son with 400 gold coins. Believe me. Today, people who are married to two sisters might not even want to look at each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. This was the love between Uthman and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. They were brothers-in-law and they loved each other from the very beginning. In fact, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, there was so much of love between him and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. That during the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an used to be seen walking with him a lot of the times. And when Al-Hasan, who is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, when he used to be a little child, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq used to take him and put him up on his shoulder and walk with him and play with him. This was the relationship they had. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good relationship. So, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he was also from amongst one of those who have been enlisted as Al-Ashara, the ten. The ten who were told, you are from paradise. His name was the fourth name. Amazing. His name was the fourth name. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. So he was also one of them in the same 
uh, circle of people who were already told that you are from amongst those in paradise. Bear in mind, he was approximately 30 years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which makes him approximately 28 years younger than Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was quite young. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he had the honor of doing the ghusl or the, the washing of the body, the blessed body of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was one of those being the cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also his son-in-law at the same time. So if we take a look at uh, the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu from Fatima radiallahu anha, from amongst them were two who were very, very well known, Al Hassan and Al Hussein. So the marriage occurred the second year of Hijrah, the third year Al Hassan was born, and the fourth year Al Hussein was born. Radiallahu anhum jami'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased upon all of them. Ali ibn Abi Talib was highly educated, he was very clever, he was known as a wise man. To this day, they are the quotations and sayings of the wise Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. There are two things. A lot of these quotations are accurate, but some of them, sometimes you have people who have find a good quotation and because of their love for Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, they add at the bottom said by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. So it's a wise quotation. They add the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be truthful. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him during his life that, Oh Ali, regarding you, the people will be divided into two extremes. There will be people who will love you so much that they will raise you beyond your rank. And there will be people who will dislike you so much that they will remove you from the fold, meaning they will drop you from, from your rank. We are people who are in the middle. We state his credentials exactly as they are. We love him and respect him. We will not utter one word against Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, just as we will not utter words against any one of the other companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because it was Muhammad. May Allah's peace be upon him who said, لا تسبوا أصحابي فوالذي نفسي بيده لو أنفق أحدكم مثل أحد ذهب ما بلغ مد أحدهم ولا نصيفة. He said, never speak bad about any one of my companions for I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I swear by the one in whose hands lies my soul. I swear by the one in whose hands lies my soul that if you were to spend the Mount Uhud full of gold, it would not be equivalent to a little handful of what they spent or even half of that handful because of their level. So none of us are allowed to speak bad about any of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we are far, far, far away from them in virtue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us even a little bit of virtue. I mean, so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time of revelation used to call Ali sometimes and ask him to write because he could read and write yet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was unlettered, unlettered in a respectful way, meaning he was kept from reading and writing by the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that nobody could accuse him of having read the previous scriptures and having come with something. So it is not something that one would say is a negative quality, na'udhu billah, but in fact it is so positive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ إِذَا لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْطِلُونَ O Messenger, before this Qur'an, you were unable to read and write. Had you been able to read and write, perhaps those who would have liked to find fault would have found fault. But they cannot doubt because you were unable to read and write. Imagine if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a powerful reader and writer, perhaps they would have said that, you know what? He has just read the previous scriptures and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us at least the ability to read this revelation that has come to us and learn from it. We are in the month of the Quran. My brothers and sisters, ask yourselves, what is your link with this Quran? So Ali ibn Abi Talib was known as Katibu Wahi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was one who used to write the revelation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to write the Quran. Then if we take a careful look at Sulh al-Hudaybiyah, we've spoken about it in the last few days. The treaty of Hudaybiyah that had happened, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu and told him, right, I'd like you to write. 
I would like you to write the following. And the treaty was actually written by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, and he was one of the witnesses of that particular treaty. When it comes to the battle of Khaybar, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in Khaybar, that tomorrow, in the night he spoke, and he said, tomorrow I will give the flag, I will give the leadership to one whom Allah loves and who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at night, people were actually thinking, who are they going to speak about? At night, they were thinking, who are they going to speak about? And they found, subhanallah, that in the morning, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Aina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where is Ali, the son of Abu Talib? And immediately they knew that this man, Allah loves him and he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he called Ali and he says, Oh Ali, say the name of Allah and enter into this Khaybar, enter into this fort of Khaybar. And remember the famous statement of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Wallahi, la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahidan khayrun laka min humurin na'am. Remember that if Allah guides through you one single person, it is better for you than the most valuable of the camels that we have. You know, the top of conveyance at the time was the red camel. Very expensive. Today, I wonder what we could say. Could we say perhaps an S-Class Mercedes Benz? S650 or something of that nature? Well, everyone has a different liking. But the truth is, the Prophet ﷺ says, it's better for you to guide one person to what is right than to have anything material that this world can offer you. My brothers and sisters, let's stop there because it's important for us to learn a lesson. This was at the time of war. Muhammad ﷺ is telling Ali, don't just go around killing people. No, guide them, teach them. If they are guided through your effort, it is better for you. Imagine, today you have people in the name of Islam going around killing people and saying we are following the sunnah of Muhammad ﷺ. It's very, very sad, subhanallah. How people do not learn from this beautiful statement of Muhammad ﷺ to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, Wallahi, O Ali. You know, don't just be trigger happy. Learn to spread the guidance. Remember to go out and guide the people. Some people look at non-Muslims and say, these are the enemies of Islam. Whereas we are taught that you look at the non-Muslims and say, these are all potential Muslims. Somewhere up the ladder, our forefathers were non-Muslim as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us to spread the deen. And may He use us to be vehicles of the spreading of the goodness, we should not be selfish with the goodness. If we were taught to eradicate everyone who was not a Muslim, believe me, we would never have existed because our forefathers would have been eradicated a long time ago. They were not Muslim at some stage. So my brothers and sisters, a powerful statement that from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, and we learn from it. When it comes to the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an, Many people say that Ali radiallahu anhu was upset and he did not want Abu Bakr as Khalifa. That is very far from the truth. He was one of the first to stretch his hand when he was in his home. And one of the people came to him and told him, do you know what is happening at Saqifa to Bani Sa'idah? The Muhajireen and Ansar have sat and this is what took place. And now Abu Bakr is being uh, appointed the leader. He quickly rushed out with half of his clothing on and he went and he stretched his hand and pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. There was no dispute. Like I said, they had such a good relation that even after that, they used to walk together. Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of the most virtuous of the lot. Radiallahu anhum jami'an. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu used to constantly ask him his opinion in so many different things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us also to ask those with knowledge their opinions when we have some important matters in our own lives. Amin. At the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu as well, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was one of those who pledged allegiance. They had such a powerful relation. Can I inform you how powerful this relation was? When Ali ibn Abi Talib, mashallah, he had many children and he married multiple wives after the death of Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She passed away approximately six months after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was the last of the children of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to pass away because all of his children passed away in his lifetime, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, besides Fatima. Fatima radiallahu anha passed away approximately six months later. After that, Ali ibn Abi Talib married the widow of Abu Bakr, as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Now, if they were enemies, why would he do that? Secondly, he looked after the child of Abu Bakr as his own child. His name was Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. 
He was the son of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq from Asma bint Umais. And Asma bint Umais radiallahu anha was married to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh after the death of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anh. How powerful. And after that, he named his children as follows. One of them was Abu Bakr ibn Ali. The other one was Umar ibn Ali. The other one was Uthman ibn Ali radiallahu anhum. But people don't tell us this, do they? These were some of the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He had a son known as Abu Bakr ibn Ali. He had a son known as Umar ibn Ali. Do you know this? May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them all. So this was the love that they had amongst each other. But there came people later on who created dispute and who created discord. This is what we spoke about yesterday. And we said, my brothers and sisters, be careful of people who come to you to create discord between you and your brethren in faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. In fact, at the time of Uthman ibn Affan, we heard yesterday that the enemies surrounded him. They were Muslimin, but they were not from amongst the Sahaba. When Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu find out, found out the depth of what was happening, he sent a message to Uthman saying, I have with me 500 of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I can send them to you now in order to eradicate those who are trying to harm you. Yet those who were trying to harm Uthman were the ones who were saying that Ali should be appointed as Khalif. And himself, he was so powerful and so just. He said, no ways, these people are wrong. We can send the companions in order to defend Uthman. Uthman, what a great man. He even named his child after Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. But Uthman ibn Affan responded to this and he said, I would not like to see the blood of Muslims being spilt because of me. I'd rather die than to see massacre amongst the Muslimin. This was, this was the status of Uthman ibn Affan. Today, people would rather see a massacre than to leave themselves. May Allah protect us. Look at how we have converted and changed completely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. May He protect the Muslimin who are struggling at the hands of their own brothers and sisters today more than the hands of anyone else. So my brothers and sisters, here we have the powerful example. So much so that Al-Hassan ibn Ali was so close to Uthman ibn Affan. He was in the house of Uthman when he was surrounded. And Uthman ibn Affan told him, Al-Hassan, I would suggest that you leave. You will be harmed. These people are getting closer every day. They are becoming more and more vocal and violent. And this is when Al-Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu left the house of Uthman. It is reported that he too was injured in that particular skirmish. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all and grant us ease. My brothers and sisters, this was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. I want to make mention of a few of the stories of his life. He once visited the graveyard during his tenure when he was appointed Khalif. He once visited the graveyard and at the graveyard, he said a statement that was a lesson for every one of us. He wanted this to be a lesson for those who heard. Obviously, he looked at the graves and he asked a question to those in the graves. Obviously, the lesson was for us, but it was asked in the form of a question. He says, I want to inform you the houses you have left have already been occupied. The wealth that you left has already been distributed and is being spent by others. The wives that you've left are already married to others. This is the news that we have. Tell us about the news that you have. Allahu Akbar. Addressing the graves. He told him everything is happening. How you left it, it's all continuing. It's gone. But we want to know about you. Then he looked at the people and he said, Wallahi, if these people could talk to us, they would tell us, Inna khayr al taqwa the best provision that you can actually have in order to get into the grave would be the piety, taqwa Allah, consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, I have a lesson from this and so do you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and may He make us from those who learn a lesson from this. Now, if we take a look at another story, Ali radiallahu anhu lost his armor at one stage when he was the Amir. And so when he went to Kufa, he found a Jewish man selling this armor. He looked at it and he said, Hey, this is my armor. The Jewish man says, No, it's mine. I'm selling it. It's in my hands. So he said, No, let's go to the Qadi. Now the Qadi was known as Shurayh. Shurayh was a powerful Qadi based in Kufa. He was appointed by Ali. Appointed by Ali. Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. Confirmed by him, although he was there from prior to his time. But Ali ibn Abi Talib went and sat right next to the Qadi and the Jewish man was in front and he says, Oh Shuraih, this man has my 
Ama. So Shuraih says, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, we need some form of evidence to prove that it is yours. So he says, Here are my sons, Al Hassan wal Hussein, those who are companions of Muhammad, وسلم, they will bear witness that this armor is mine. So Shuraih says, I am very sorry, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, with all due respect. A child cannot bear witness for his own father here according to the law of Islam. So I will have to rule that this armor belongs to the Jewish man. The Jewish man was stunned. He was shocked to the degree that he said, I am so shocked. This is Amirul Mu'mineen, the leader who rules so many lands and he is sitting here in front of a Qadi that is under him and he has just given me this armor. He says, no ways. I bear witness that this is the true deen. I bear witness that Allah is one and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger. Immediately he accepted Islam. This was an incident that had occurred at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. He was happy. He did not get upset with, with Shuraih and say, I appointed you. Now you can leave. And he did not make life difficult. That was a judge. He was independent and he spoke the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. The son of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was asked a question. That in fact, he asked his father, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, who was the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he asked his father, Who is the best of people after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So his father said, Abu Bakr as Siddiq, subhanallah. So the son says, And who next? He says, Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu. Now the son was worried that hey, I, I need my father's name somewhere. So he said, what about you, O oh my father? He says, Ma ana illa rajulun min al -muslimin. He says, I am just a man from amongst the Muslims. This is how humble he was. This is how modest he was. He says, I am just a Muslim. Yet the Prophet ﷺ had told him, O oh Ali, you are from amongst those who already have paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and bless them all. I want to make mention of one last major point that has moved me. He used to read Salah at night, every single night. And he used to fast a lot in terms of voluntary fasts. So the people asked him, O oh Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, you are a man, you know that you are from paradise, yet you are standing at night and you are fasting every day. What is it? So he looks at them and he says, Safarul akhirati tawil, fayahtaju ila qat'ihi bisayr al-layl. He says the journey to the life after, meaning the journey into paradise, is a very long journey. You need to travel towards it by night. Listen to this. You need to travel towards it by night. Wallahi, this has moved me. By night, if you are fast asleep all the time, your journey to paradise is going to be made more difficult. You really want to travel into paradise? Well, you better start traveling by making that journey at night. Stand up in salah for Allah. My brothers and sisters, I hope that can motivate myself and yourselves to read at least our taraweeh correctly and to get up at least for tahajjud. Whilst we are busy eating for suhoor, do you know it is the time of tahajjud? I would suggest we take a moment to at least start traveling towards paradise by using that time, even if it means to engage in two units of salah, two raka'at of salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was martyred. He was martyred when he was approximately 63 years old, the 40th year of hijrah by a man known as Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. He was a man who was dead against Ali ibn Abi Talib. One might ask, why were they against Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu? One simple reason. When Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was murdered, the people were divided into two groups. One of them remained with Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, who did not seek to penalize the murderers immediately, but he sought to deal with them in a different way. And the others had sought the penalization of those who murdered Uthman immediately. They said, Oh Ali, you as an Amir need to penalize those who have murdered Uthman immediately. So this was the difference of opinion primarily as what to do exactly with those who have murdered Uthman ibn Affan. Should we deal with them now or should we deal with them as time passes? It was actually an issue that divided the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. It resulted in two major groups, those who were with Ali ibn Abi Talib, those who actually were against what he was doing. But at the same time, there were other disgruntled people. One of them was Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. He bought a sword and he put on that sword a lot of poison and he 
sliced the belly of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu or he actually pierced him with that particular sword with, with the poison that he had put on it. And Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu passed away three days later. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this type of fitna. Really, people from amongst the Muslimin killing one another. This is what has caused destruction from the very beginning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. I want to end by saying, Radiyallahu anis sahabati ajma'een. May Allah be pleased with all these companions. May Allah be pleased with every single one of them. My brothers and sisters, it is not for us to say one word of hatred against any one of those. They were the superheroes. They were the superstars. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu or rahimahullah who was one of the great leaders, he says that we should protect our tongues from uttering utterances regarding the difficulties that happened between the Sahaba. Some may have been right, the others would have been forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.